Welcome to the Ocean Races interview series. I'm joined by Ken Reed, the president of North Sales, but of course, a three-time competitor in the America's Cup, three times in the Ocean Race, twice as skipper. And I mean, president of North Sales, surely a position you don't get to by being just a good sailor. You need to have some business sense as well. So, you know, Ken, straight off the bat, let me ask you, I mean, when all this is over and you retire, are you going to be known as a great business leader in the industry or a phenomenal sailor? But just a leader in the industry, maybe. Um, I think that's really important because the industry and sailing and, and all, the, all the types of sailing that I've done, are, they're attached in some form or fashion. Because one of the reasons why I think I was hired to do the job I'm in right now is because I ran big programs. And it's the same thing. Running North Sales is not too dissimilar from uh, running a Volvo program, for example. And and you know especially when you're dealing with all the trauma and all the like today for example you're in the middle you know i i i lived on tristan de cuna for five days after breaking my mass in the middle of the ocean so you've got to deal with stuff as it hits you and you don't have a choice to say oh time out um let's let's not do that let's you just gotta you gotta roll with the punches so i think sailboat racing in effect helps you run a company because it really gives you great training for rolling with the punches. And that's what all those programs do. Well, there's so many great lessons that you've obviously learned from all the campaigns, as you say, you know, that you've been involved with. And I, and I want to get to those. But just before we do, um, at the moment, you know, I'm guessing that, uh, you know, you're in the States, Newport at the moment. I mean, w what's the latest for North with, with everything that's kind of uh, going on? Well, North is a complicated entity because you know, we're in 23 countries. We got manufacturing facilities in seven different countries. Uh, we have 2,000 employees. We make 30,000 sales a year. Uh, right now, we're 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 still manufacturing in some of our locations, but some of our bigger locations are not. But we are still manufacturing in some of our key locations, so we're able to at least at least create and then send as soon as supply chains start opening back up again. But Listen, any company on the planet has dip difficult decisions to make right now, and uh, and North is not immune to that. Nor are any of our NTG companies. You know, but we have Southern Spars is obviously very involved with with the race. Uh, so is Future Fibers, and you know the rigging side. So, listen, our, a lot of our companies are very attached to the ocean race right now, and we just got to get the manufacturing process up and running again. Shockingly enough, this is unbelievable, but we. Last week, our year-to-year -year orders, let's call them, you know, let's call them $2 million. Last week, we sold $1.7 million worth of sales. So people are still yeah. interested in going sailing. And fa it's fascinating. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I think, I really do think that people are going to look at sailing as, a way to kind of have their own little refuge to, to go out and be secluded with their families. Listen, the regattas are all postponed and, or, or a lot have been canceled, but, but people are going to want to go sailing again because it's healthy. It's safe. You're with your family. You can protect yourself. Um, Marina's here talking about being open um, as normal. A lot of yacht clubs and limited forms and fashion are talking about being open, you know, obviously with lots of social distancing. So anyway, we got to still run a company in, in this crazy time. And uh, fortunately, we have a really, really good executive team um, that we can hopefully keep sorted. Well, I mean, as you say, things are still happening. And of course, it was, um, you know, North Sales tied to the race are going to be supplying the sales again for the VO65. And I want to I want to talk to you about that a little bit later on, because just as a warning, I'm hoping that you're going to be pretty candid and you're going to give us some insight as to maybe what the teams were doing in the last few editions to find those edges of speed, not easy in a one design class, but you know, before I do, it wasn't always that you had this much responsibility in the sailing world on your shoulders. I mean, can you think that far back as to when it was that you first, you know, fell in love with the sport? Was it just getting on a boat and thinking, well, this is great. Or, or did it take a little bit of convincing? I hated sailing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was terrified when I was a kid, you know, you see all these kids in Optis these days. So the Optis were a bit before or a bit after my time, the Opti phenomenon. But mm. 
I grew up right right up the bay here in in Barrington, Rhode Island, and uh, I hated it. I mean, when I say hate, I, I would go out in a tiny little river, and I would tell the instructors that I was seasick to get out of it. You know, and how can, you can't be seasick. The river is about that wide. You know, so um, my father conned me into you know going back for one more summer, and I met a group of friends, and before you know it, um, it wasn't so bad because I had some friends, um, and and it just kind of exploded. So at every step of the way, there, there seemed to be another challenge. And it was very localized. I wasn't one of these kids that went to World Youth Championships and things like that. But it was all very localized. And it just kept steamrolling. And mm. kind of my mantra, and when I talk to youth uh, groups, um, you, gotta, you have to produce at a level that the next level is, is calling your phone. So it, because I just learned through dumb luck it's like wow i just won this 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 and this and the coolest big boat on the bay wants a young guy to come sail with them so i'm doing the bow on that boat next time next thing you know hey this kid on the bow actually kind of knows where to go on the race course let's bring him back here you win at that level you go to the next level the next level the next level just kept snowballing it was nothing i ever planned but by any means the only thing i planned is that you know, a, a buddy of mine i got a great job out of college and college sailing was really the breakthrough for me and um, so I was college sale of the year and then, you know, Boston university was a great school to go to. And, uh, you, you're an all American for a, a few years and, and college sale of the year. And all of a sudden Marine companies are calling you to go work for them because this is, this is just before pro sailing really got going and pro sailing has changed everything. Quite frankly. Um, everybody talks about the commercialization of the sport and all these Volvo boats, you know, with a big Puma logo or a Matt Frey logo or whatever, that, that isn't nearly what professional sailing did for, for the sport. So we were professional sailors back then, but we all worked for sail makers, boat builders, mass makers. And um, so we got a business pedigree background, whether we liked it or not. And um, w one of my best friends and, and, um, a guy named Dan Neri, he and I ended up buying a local sail loft here in Newport called Shore Sales at the time. And he and I, I just got off the phone with him. He and I still work today. We've been working together for, Jesus Christ, it's a long time. <laughs> Excuse my French, it's a long time. I don't even know how many years. And, but North ended up buying our company and we ended up on, on their management group at North and um, right away because they wanted younger younger guys. Believe it or not, I was young at the time. And, and uh, and then through North, you know, through Tom's, Tom Widden's tutelage, she kept pushing me out to do things like, hey, Dennis Connor, you know, needs somebody to skipper his boat. You want to, you know, and I'm sure he was part of that conversation with Dennis because he and Dennis go way back. And then all of a sudden Volvos start happening and he kept nudging me out of the office. He's like, go screw things up, go make mistakes, <laughs> go do well, you know, and, and come back with more knowledge and, and more experience. And frankly, like I said at the very beginning, all that, all those building blocks and all those failures and successes and failures and successes led to today and trying to get through this insanity. Uh, honestly, it was great training. <laughs> and of course, you know, I mean, you're starting to get some good uh, reputation at that point. I mean, where were you looking? Were you seeing that far ahead? You're thinking, you know, America's Cup you know, ocean race, all those offshore miles, record breaking, or were you just enjoying the moments? Enjoying the moments, 100%. The, you know, I, I can still tell you, I still have stuff downstairs from uh, the 1985 J24 Worlds in Atsumi Bay, Japan, which was still, that, that was a pivotal, that was our first world championship. And um, <clears throat> no, I, I, it never even dawned on me to think that, far ahead. I wasn't that smart. I, 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 I just, you know, you, you clamp on to the next goal and you just, you know, grip your teeth around it and you don't let go until, until you got it. And so that's, that's kind of the way that worked. And the move into sail making, um, you know, everybody, every young sailor at the moment is trying to find a way to make themselves more attractive, more attainable, more right. rewarding for a professional team. Was it that that motivated you to get into the sail making? Was it, was it a business venture? Did it just get you on the water more? Uh, business and water for sure. Because 
again, remember there was no pro sailing. So mm. t- for me to go racing every week, every weekend, I mean, literally every, that's why you don't have any relationships back then because your relationship is with the next boat and the next crew. So um, it was all about uh, the, the next event and getting on the water. And when Dan and I bought shore sales, you know, the way we set it up is he ran the, the kind of commercial uh, manufacturing design side of it. And I was the sales and marketing and water side of it. And, and by the way, by the way, if you won for take the J24 class, for example, if you won the worlds, it was, and this is a little company. It was essentially a $500,000 difference in that next year's revenue in a tiny company. And, and just, the difference between first and second and being able to advertise winning the world championships in J24s and there were thousands of J24s that were racing at the time. It was a massive deal. So Kenny, get your ass out there and practice, you know, we, let's quit screwing around. We gotta, we gotta win this regatta. And, and um, yeah, so it, it all tied together business, the business and the sailing side, they, they were completely intertwined. And and then, of course, that, you know, you, you, you get um, taken into North. They see you. They see the potential. They see the potential of your, of your business. Now, I mean, I've been uh, a sailor for many years, so I know about the power <coughs> and the lure of North sales and how everybody ultimately wants to wear that badge if you're working in the, in the sail making industry. Was it when you got approached by them, did you again just see that as another opportunity to go, well, with, with this name behind me, I can do more? So this is a, here, here's a backroom story. I don't think I've ever told this before, but Dan and I were getting tired. We were 10 years into it and we were shore sales. And then we kind of outgrew shore sales, unfortunately. And we were Sobstads. We licensed the name Sobstad Sales for three years. Our, our license was coming up. Dan, I mean, we were working our asses off. We were literally working our asses off. And we were tired. And 3DL had just come out. And so this is like 1995 or so, 96, 95, I was Yachtsman of the Year. Um, so we were still, we were in pretty good shape. Our business was slowly getting better. We were, the, we were the small business administrations were still like their poster child for lending money to two young people who no bank would touch to buy that business. And we paid off our loan, I don't know, three years early or something, you know, we, we were taking this small company, but man, it was a lot of work and we were getting tired and 3DL to me, 3DL was the writing on the wall. Like, listen, this paneled sail making thing, this isn't going to work. And Genesis was our big product at Sobstad. And we had some struggles with Genesis trying to make that work. Cause I was very content. Let's just make the second best product. And then we'll be number two. You know, what was the, uh, sure. the rental car companies, you know, there was Hertz and then Avis and Avis ab- actually advertised we're number two, you know, we're the good guys. We're number two. And, um, and then Tom Whitten called and, uh, said, we're getting sick of you guys. You're, you're, we're getting tired of you guys and we need to get younger on our board. And, and I, and I, um, I think I went over to Dan's house and I sat down. I'm like, you're not going to believe what just happened. And, uh, and, um, I think we would have taken that deal for free. You know, because we, saw, because we did, we saw the, we saw the, the, op, the opportunities for us for the future. You know, we, we, I got a hold of 3DL as a sailboat racer, which I was just, I, I couldn't wait because it was so much better than anything else we were all doing. And, um, and we just saw a f- our, our future and sure enough, our future, you know, I'm president of the company and Dan's uh, CEO, you know, so like I said before, you got to get lucky every once in a while. And I, for some reason, we've made a career of getting lucky and hopefully um, we continue that way. Okay, because I mean, when you talk about getting lucky, I mean, the next thing that basically comes along in that timeline is the America's Cup. Uh, the first time that you were involved with the America's Cup, that was 95. Um, and then, of course, you know, the next time that you get back into an, uh, an America's Cup campaign, you're there... Uh, as a helm i mean you know this is the, this was the start of um sailing with um you know big american name but obviously international name as well you know D- dennis connor how did how did that moment come about how did you get 
uh, you know, how did you cross paths with him? How, how did your two worlds kind of collide? Uh, a phone call of which I thought it was a crank call from one of my buddies. <laughs> right, you know, I mean, seriously, you can't make this stuff up. And, and uh, you know, hi, hi, Ken, this is Dennis Connor. I'm like, yeah, this guy's name is Brad Dimio. I said, yeah, Dem, what do you want? And he's like, well, uh, this is Dennis Connor. You know, a very, you know, Dennis, anybody can recognize his, his voice from a mile away. And uh, he had this idea that Chris Dixon, um, who was in the process of skippering his uh, Volvo boat or his Whitbread boat at the time, Chris was going to win the Whitbread, um, but it, you know, it's all of a sudden the ties to the Whitbread and the Volvo and the ocean race start happening. <clears throat> so, you know, Ken, I got this guy Dixon, and he's the best. You know, he's the best helmsman in the world, and he's going on and on, uh, and he's like, "You're going to be his tactician." Um, and I already talked to Tom, and Tom's already given permission. So I, now I'm working for North Sales. It's like, all right, so he already figured out how to get go around me. So we start talking, and then about two weeks later. Dixon gets fired. I, I, I don't even know the inside of that story. And I get another phone call. I'm in town. We're going to lunch. And so we go to lunch at this little place up the street from our loft. And Dennis and me, and uh, and he says, "You're the guy. You're gonna you're gonna you're gonna helm my boat." And uh, and by the way, and then he wanted to talk about Etchells. He said, "By the way, I, I need some of your Etchell sales because you're winning everything in Etchell, So I, I need your sales." So then about two weeks later, we're at a regatta and he, tr he uses my etchel sales and gets pounded. And I'm winning the regatta <clears throat> and he comes back in. And after about 15 beers, he goes, man, did I make the right call on a skipper? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, your sales suck so badly that if you can make them go, then you must be the best sailor on the planet. I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. And that was the beginning of... I don't know, five, six, five years of just bizarreness. Just, you just couldn't predict the next moment, you know, with, with Dennis and, and the Stars and Stripes team and a massive highs and some terrible lows and some lessons learned and some great races, some great people. And it was just, I wouldn't trade, again, wouldn't trade it for the world. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Do, I mean, did you... Did you feel like you had belonged? Did you feel like you'd got to a moment? I mean, joining Dennis Connor, you know, campaigning for the America's Cup. I mean, that's a peak in anybody's <clears throat> book. Did you feel like I'm here? I've got every right to be here. Or did sometimes you find yourself looking around the room thinking, ah, oh, you know, I mean, I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to get caught out. I mean, what, what was that moment like emotionally? Um, wow. That's a, that's a, I have to do a little like self analysis here for a second. Uh, I think every athlete on the planet has their good days and their bad days, everyone. And there were some days where you're just freaking Superman and the cape is long and it's flowing in the breeze and there's nothing you can do wrong. It's just get the bleep out of my way because I'm going to mow you down. And then as quickly as that happens comes the, what the hell am I doing? You know, A, you made a mistake very visually in front of the whole world on the water, or B, you got a big personnel decision to make, or C, you know, you got don donors breathing down your throat. You know, how come you haven't changed this keel? There's a lot of experts in the, in the America's Cup world. And um, it's a character. I think it's just easiest to say it's a character builder. There's... It's like any, it's like, it's like any professional athlete. There are huge highs and terrible lows, terrible lows. And uh, the best fight through it, the best figure it out. And they get, and they move on the quickest. And, and so that's all you had to do. That's what you had to do. And you have to have a great support group around you. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, as you say, the highs and lows, I mean, one quote that I did read from you, which I've got to say is, is something that I've heard a lot of um, America's cup sailors say when they then go down the offshore route is they get bored of sailing windward leewards to death um you know is that is that the way you felt because the next thing that we see you in is the volvo ocean race and starting to make a big name for yourself in offshore sailing i got sick i i was sick of it i i literally i mean not to this day but um 
you know, I never got, I never jumped back in, let's say with a TP52 circuit or something like that. It was a huge time commitment and it's just a loop, a loop, a loop, a loop. And I, I, I wanted to do something completely different. Yeah. After that, the, the, the 2003 cup um, really had me thinking about what my future looked like in, in sailing. Um, when won the Etchell's worlds right after that was still one of our, my proudest moments. Um, and and after that um, came the phone call from Neil McDonald, you know, three quarters of the way through that Volvo race uh, with the Ericsson team. And, you know, uh, Ericsson was a classic Volvo program where they were, they were underperforming pre-race expectations, very similar to our America's Cup in 2003. And if you go back in the history of Volvo races and you look at crew turnover, you always find who, who, where the expectations lie before the race started. And the more turnover, the higher the expectations, the lower, the, the worse the result. And, and Ericsson had great expectations. You know, they had an all-star team and they're well-funded and just, you know, same old, you know, every once in a while, it just doesn't go your way. For a variety of reasons, it wasn't going their way. So that's when they brought in Kisteki as, a, as, a, as the new skipper. Neil moved into, this is down in um, Brazil, I believe, on their way up to Annapolis. Hmm. Then Kisteki, I believe, gets the call for the next cup, maybe, from Ellison or something. I think he, all of a sudden he got a better offer. Yeah. And, um, and on the way up, he announces while doing that leg, I believe, that he and Ross Halcro, the, new kind of, the two new guys, are actually leaving after one leg. And I just remember, I just remember thinking to myself, um, this is, uh, there aren't many people around right now, especially in the United States and a quick stopover in, in Baltimore, because I think it was a pit stop. I, I don't even think they pulled the boats out of the water. Um, they're going to need somebody who can do something like that. Literally 20 minutes later or something. And I'd never talked to Neil McDonald in my life. Uh, he said, Hey, can you come down to Annapolis and, and let's talk? And, I was on the next plane uh, two hours later and we did a deal that afternoon and he said, just do the next couple legs, the, the, the pit stop up to New York and then the transatlantic. And I said, ah, the only way I'm doing this is to do the whole rest of the race. Cause I don't want to be that guy. I, I don't want to be, I want to be part of the team. I want to be one of the boys. Little did I know that I was essentially the only person on the boat that didn't smoke cigarettes at the time. I did. <laughs> it was, it was back in the day. God, I, I, that's, I always used to, Plus, all the guys, it's like if you guys took sailboat racing half as seriously as you take keeping your cigarettes lit when waves are coming over the water, we'd be ahead by freaking 500 miles. <laughs> and so it was a great group. It was, it, it was, I mean, obviously, it was a trial by fire for me. Um, I learned a ton the the leg of course across the atlantic where a uh, movie star sinks and and hans horovitz is lost uh, that's still that those are still memories that are burnt that are etched in you for the rest of your life that um that you'll never get rid of for all the right reasons so it was um it was kind of a put up or shut up moment you know for me it was you got every reason to say this isn't for me i'm out of here you know like england when i we got to england it's like I don't know if I'm made for this stuff, man. This is, this is, this is more than anybody's good for. I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm up to this, but stuck it out through the rest of that race. You know, Ericsson improved. Um, and I got the bug. I got hooked. This is not when we're lure racing. <laughs> this is not going around the cans anymore, man. I'll tell you that this is a whole new world. And I think I'm kind of up for this whole new world. It was that, was that your first, uh jump into offshore because like you said that leg was pretty notorious and i'm just trying to imagine um being involved in that moment in the races past and then deciding to carry on with the commitment that you did i mean how much offshore experience did you have to sort of lean back on and go well it can be easier it can be harder i mean coming into that were you just completely green uh, well, I wouldn't say completely green, but, you know, I had trans packs and Bermuda races and fast net races under my belt, but I had never lived, I had never sailed through 
conditions even close to what we sailed through in that transatlantic leg. That was a rough, that was a bad leg. It wasn't, it was one, two or three, I think it was three serious fronts came through. And it was, yeah, it was, it was the real deal. And so I guess to answer your question, I was green as hell. I had plenty of offshore miles, but nothing like that. I'd never been transatlantic before. Um, really none of us had ever sailed Canton keel boats before. I, Richard Mason was on the boat and I, I remember trying to get in my bunk and the noises coming out, you know, that was the infamous, that was the first evolution of Canton keel boats. And the noises coming out of the center of that boat were, you know, you're careening off of waves. I mean, careening. And I'm like, Hey, is that normal? And he's like, yeah, mate, get, get used to it. It's, it's fine, mate. It's like, you don't have a freaking clue if we're, if that's going to, he goes, no, nope. but you know what? Got us here. So, so far, so good. We're, we'll be, fine. we'd be fine. It's like, Jesus Christ. What am I but getting then, myself into? I mean, in those situations, you know, like you say, the noises, I mean, anybody that's been on a boat will know those noises. And I can only imagine what that's like when you're in conditions where you know you're on or beyond the limit. In those sort of situations, are you happiest in your bunk? Or are you happiest on deck in with some degree of control? So that's a good question. I found myself, I found my best role. I love the strategic side of it. So um, uh, that's where I really found there are people definitely better than me in heavy air driving. And, um, but I, I really, I really started to embrace the, uh, kind of the the navigator assistant you know a tactician navigator relationship um, um a guy named mark rudiger the late the late great mark rudiger uh was our navigator on that leg because again they, they had a whole a whole a whole new rotation of people so so rudy was the navigator and he and i would sit for hours at the nav station and i'd ask questions and the questions would get him thinking then he said well if this happened you know it, it it was that leg that really got me hooked into the uh, the chess game that is mm -hmm. that is offshore sailing, and I loved that part of it. I, I that's what I really loved. I, I love more than anything the chess game. So, um, you know, on deck, down below, that almost doesn't matter as long as the chess game is still going in your head all the time. And, and that's, so that's, that's what I ended up doing. I think the most of and enjoying the most um, for, for my Volvo experiences. And then of course, you know, after that, you come back, you come back as a skipper with, uh, with the Puma uh, team. How did that, how did you get that call? Were you fishing for a skipper role or did something just sort of come along and you took it? Yeah, that, that was a complete come along and take it um, moment because uh, so I actually, yeah, I actually went over and interviewed for the new Ericsson job and because I've been with Ericsson and um, they chose, of all, they chose John Kostecki at the time. Uh, he's back. And you know he'd won the he'd won the Volvo before, so he can't can't argue with the choice. And then <laughs> Stecky leaves, I think, again for for Oracle. Doesn't ever sail on Ericsson at all the second time around. And I had already started up with um, the potential Puma program, and that's when you know they took a back seat and they hired a B team guy named Torben Grail. And so you know he has no resume or anything, so I have no idea why that happened. And um, and so it ended up working for the best because I'm not sure Puma and the Puma program even happens if I don't continue kind of down this path. If I hadn't, if I had been named skipper of Ericsson, um, Puma doesn't, I don't think Puma happens um, because it wasn't like they were looking for it. So I, I ended up sailing, sailing on a maxi boat at the maxi worlds with the guy who was the, uh, who, who had controlling interest, stock interest in Puma. And he was on their board and he said, they're expanding. They're doing great. Puma's doing great. And they're looking for more crazy. And I, I, so I was, I was there right after the transatlantic, you know, the last, the Ericsson, the small little Ericsson bit I did. I'm telling all these stories at dinner and he kept sitting next to me. He's like, tell me another story. Tell me another story. So I'm telling all these stories. 
And at the end of it, he's like, at the end of it, we win, we win the Maxi Worlds and our class. And he's thrilled. And he's like, let's go have a beer. Wonderful guy. And we go have a beer and, and he's like, you know what, this Volvo thing sounds just crazy enough for Puma to think about. So I'm going back to a board meeting in a couple of weeks and don't be surprised if we get in touch with you. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, I have a job. I'm, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. And three weeks later, the CEO, uh, Jochen Zeitz, completely random calls my flip, my little flip phone at the time and says, uh, I hear, I hear, um, I hear you're going to, I hear we're going to win the next Volvo race together. I'm like, who the hell is this? And that started this again, six, seven years of pure insanity with the coolest company, Antonio Bertone, you know, getting chemo involved, um, cast of characters, highs, lows. Puma was the greatest sponsor you could ever have because they were fully nuts. They would do anything. They would try anything. They, they loved doing stunts. They loved, they loved the crazier, the better. Yo, one of Yokens, he said, you know, I, I forget one night we're talking about just trying to keep the boys under control when you get to the dock, you know, it's like, he's like, just remember if anybody gets arrested, you have to wear your Puma shirt when you get photographed in jail. It's like that pretty much sums up Puma. <laughs> That's the, what a great, what a great place. What a great place to go to work. Absolutely. I mean, but being in the, you know, being in the skipper role of that, obviously, like you say, it sounds like a great team. It sounds like a great um, vibe, but you've got the responsibility of a lot of people uh, in some of the most hostile places on the planet. Um, and then of course, you know, with the dismasting as well, uh, in the second, uh, second edition that you guys raced with uh, as Puma, um, how did you find when those, like you say, highs and lows rolled by, how did you find having that responsibility on your shoulder as the skipper role there? Well, the first, the first race, clearly not as well. I was kind of feeling all out, <clears throat> you know, that we had, I think in Singapore, we had darn close to a, a revolt uh, on board the boat. I just wasn't handling it properly. Um, uh, we made it around and, you know, we were struggling in kind of that third ish place, third, fourth place. And then made it, then started acting like a leader and made some tough decisions. And I think the last four or five legs, we had like a two, two, one, two or something like that. And, you know, started to just, just act like a freaking leader, stick with your gut. And yeah. some people aren't going to be happy and some people are, and maybe some of the decisions aren't going to be perfect, but you know what? You're trying something and um, you're sticking with your gut. And uh, so whether you're on the water, I mean, on the water, you're in the moment. And I guess sometimes laying in your bunk, you, you do have the thought of, I never want to make that phone call to a wife or a kid or a parent that they're, that they're, that their son or their husband is lost, that, that doesn't get lost on skippers. Every skipper on the planet ha has those moments. Um, but at the same time, you're in a boat race. And that's what we were, for some God unknown reason, we were born to be in boat races. And it is a grind and you will do anything to, to make it out ahead in that grind. And it's pretty phenomenal experience, man. There, there are times where you're on that water thinking this is the only place on the planet I would want to be right now. This feels right. And then 24 hours later, I would rather be selling Dunkin' Donuts coffee for the rest of my life than be on this boat right now. And nothing against Dunkin' Donuts coffee. No, no, it, no, no. You get, you get my drift. It was whew, highs and lows like you can't fathom. And, and, and that was, you know, that second time with Puma, that was, that was the last time that we've seen you in uh, – the Volvo Ocean Race as a competitor, but of course not the last time that you've been, you know, out in the water offshore. Right? You know, you're, you know, currently hold the um, transatlantic record, I think, on on Comanche, which I, you know, I'd love to get a few details on in just a minute. But in between that, you become the president of North Sales. Earlier on, you were saying that a lot of the decisions you made within that sort of business structure was that it gave you opportunities to chase down more sailing. Well, 
what more sailing is there for someone to do that's already done three America's Cup campaigns, three Volvo Ocean Race campaigns. Did you do that because of the toys and the research that potentially you got to play with? Or was it just an, a natural business decision to make? No, a natural business decision, no, no question. Um, you know, right after the second Volvo, along comes Jim Clark, and uh, who has the bug just to do stuff at that stage. And Comanche was, again, another unbelievable experience. You know, the 24-hour record, the Bermuda race record, the Transpac record. The Do you look back and think, oh, I was involved in the America's Cup in the pure match racing days and, you know, that's something to be proud of? Or do you wish you were there in those kind of frantic foiling moments that we're seeing at the moment? Well, I, I, so I think it's really difficult to put it together like that because you deal, you deal with the, the that, that you're given, you know, that you're dealt. So. Um, Listen, it, I, I love, <laughs> I actually love announcing this America's Cup stuff right now because I, it keeps me current and I don't go, uh, I'm not in the gym 24 hours a day and I can actually have a real life, but I, I'm, I still stay close to the good young sailors, to the great young sailors hmm. and stay at the kind of the pinnacle of the sport in a completely different way. Again, tripping over it, um, completely tripping over it. but. Um, it happened, and it's something that I would love to continue. I, it, I, I enjoy, and it's still so. It's my way of sticking with the cup. But as far as like offshore sailing and other sailing, I still got plenty in me. Um, you know, there's stuff that I talk to different teams and programs about every day, and certainly cups and even Volvos or ocean races would be really hard at this stage to do. Ocean race, probably physically and mentally, um, it wouldn't be perfect uh, at my age. But at the same time, you know, I, I think we can get ready. To me, it'd be harder mentally than it would be physically. Um, but cop stuff, no, 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 no. That's long in the past. <laughs> Well, of course, you will be involved in the next edition of the Ocean Race, because as we said at the beginning of this interview, uh, North Sales is um, going to be there with the vo 65s we haven't got long left so i'm going to go straight in for this and i'm going to really uh, hope that you're going to be as honest as possible because of course during the last two editions you know, the teams didn't want to be forthcoming about the little tweaks and the little things that they were doing to try and make themselves go fast so what does north sales have in mind for the wardrobe of the next race for the VO65? You know, what are those teams going to have to do? And do you have any ideas as to what us as fans should be looking out for? Where do you think those teams are going to be playing to find those edges of speed? So there's no question that our Helix technology is going to be used on, on the big flying sails. Um, we still haven't made a decision. We, we talk, we're in conversations with several of the teams. We still haven't made 100% conclusions as to how radically different they would do anything. One of the, one of the, listen, we have plenty of selling points. First of all, thanks to drones in the last race, we now know how badly Volvo sa or Ocean Race sailors ruin their boats and their sails. I mean, thank goodness for drones because there, you can't, you can't make that stuff up, right? You, you literally can't explain it or a photograph or a video on board the boat does not do anything justice as to what the type of abuse that, that goes into the product. So from a testing standpoint or testing ground and what we do with our 3DI product, there is no better testing ground. So it's so important to our company to have evolved from two races ago to last race where there were virtually I mean, there was one um, significant break of uh, Matt Frey's mainsail in half, but that was after all the slides and cars broke off. They sailed the whole Southern Ocean with no, essentially no attachments to the mast from the sail. So it, it, in a really rough Southern Ocean leg. So listen, that had nothing to do with the sail. That was, that was abuse. That was full abuse. So we were, we were thrilled by what we learned in that race. And Gautier Sargent, um, who's our lead designer for the ocean rate for the 65s, this just trickles right through our whole 
line of, of product. So we can't be North Sales today without the ocean race because it keeps pushing us harder. So the Helix um, technology in some form or fashion will be on all the front sails. That should take some loads off the boat, should make the sails a little more forgiving in a wider range, and it could open up wider ranges with sails that we've never seen before. So that's, that's number one to answer your question. The use of the struts, of the, of the reaching struts, has gone to extremes that nobody ever thought, and now they're, they're strong enough, and they're making sails change, do things in different shapes and different, um, uh, different settings that they ever have before, and that will continue to evolve. A big one for the last race was people uh, lose, using less keel cant in, mm. in different conditions and how that changed the boat. And then this time they're, they're back to, instead of an A3 downwind, they're back to using a nylon A4, a big, a big standard asymmetric. So that's a big change in, in the boat. That's really the only, that I foresee, the only big change in the sail plan besides using Helix, but that's, a, that's kind of a smaller change. The A4 is going to bring a whole series of tactical decisions. Do we want to be low and slow for this next big front shift, or do we want to be high and fast, you know, triple head with the with the masthead zero to the to the next frontal line? So, I think what it might do is open up the fleet a little bit more. The fleet I always called it. It was like a little kid soccer game where the where the fleet kind of ran over to that corner and chased the ball, and then ran to that corner and ran to that corner. I think this time we go back to more Volvo 70 days where you have a real downwind option between triple head or, or the A4 or the, or the asymmetric. And you might see some quite big splits again. And to me, that, that's exciting. Again, we go back to the tactical side of things. I, I love the tactical side. And, and um, I think that might create some real tactical decisions. Okay. Well, uh, we've only got time for one last question. And it's interesting hearing you talk about uh you know the ocean race in its past and you know maybe a little part of you would you know maybe without the hardship and without the cold and without the you know the the, the seasickness or whatever maybe you'd still like to be out there so if i was to force you if i was to put you out there on one of the the fleets would you choose to be on the vo65 one design tight controlled racing or would you prefer to be on the Amoka 60s, new technology, and a lot to play with on the design side. Where would you allow me to force you to be? That's, that's the easiest question you've asked so far, and it, for sure on the 60 footers. But th what, I, I, what I really enjoyed, and you look at, so all, everything you've, every box you've checked, it, it, you know, let's talk about America's Cups, let's talk about all the Volvos you did. It's a design contest. Um, even more than a sailing contest very often because I've said it a million times. I'll say it a million more. The race is won before the first gun goes off. Now there's luck involved. Our, our mass falling down and ending up in Tristan de Cuna, these things can derail the best, the best of the best. So there's always luck involved, especially you got to be lucky, a little lucky in, in, in something like the ocean race, but the design contest is, is so fun and especially i mean i live it every day right i'm talking to the best designers in the world every day about their, their essentially their package above the deck the southern spars the future farvers and the north sales package i get to talk about this every day and that's what i love I, I i love that side of it i think the 60s are crazy advanced right now i mean what they're you know charlie enright was telling me a story in that and the uh, TJV he did with their training boat with the um, 11th hour racing boat he said depending on the conditions there were times where you are three or four knots faster than one boat in the condition in the next day they go by you going three or four knots faster because the conditions just changed a little bit in, in your foil package your your sail aspect ratio package fits to this better than this so they have to make some wild decisions way 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 out ahead of the race because you can't just go make a foil you can't just go change a system like that on a boat you they're making decisions now which are going to win or lose the race for them and i just hope there's more new boats that can they can get done and i, I really hope that the refits of of some of the boats that are going to do the bonday 
I hope those refits really make those boats competitive because we need a competitive, the high speed part of the race versus the one design part of the race. They have, they both have their wonderful qualities, but the, that high speed cutting edge part, I think that's new and exciting back in the race. I just hope that boats. Okay. And lastly, obviously we've got some young sailors that are going to be doing the ocean race for the first time. You know, as we said, you had a, a baptism of fire the first time that you came into it. Any small words of wisdom for the people that are going to be jumping on board these boats for the first time going offshore into what is, you know, one of the largest stadiums that you can ever have? What would you say to them? Well, first of all, clip on. You, you, can't, you can't be lost if you're clipped onto the boat. That's what I say to everybody all the time. Um, listen, one of, the best, one of the best rules way back when that the Volvo ever did back then and now the ocean race has carried on is this under 30 or under, I forget where the rule uh, sits now. I think getting more females involved with the race, getting more young people involved with the race, it brings, it's, it is creating a new generation of premier sailors. And, you know, to see the Burlings of the world jump in in this last race was phenomenally good. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm signaling him out because his pedigree happens to be pretty good at this stage. Um, but there were a lot of great young male and female sailors in that race last time. So the continuation of that process is hugely important uh, for our sport in the high end of our sport. And for the youngsters, it goes back to one of your first, you, you got to just, there's no shortcuts. You can't get, you can't just call up one of these boats. You got you have to have a resume that A, you've won at, at certain levels, and B, you can't just step onto a boat being a great sailor anymore. Hey, I'm, I'm a really good 49er driver. Well, great. Do you know how to, do you know how to, are you a sailmaker? Are you a rigger? Are you an engineer? Are you an electrician? Um, can you work with carbon fiber on the fly? Um, uh, are you a navigator? Are you a, this, I mean, you have to have, you have to be multifaceted or you have no you have no place in it you have to be able to do something at an expert level mickey Mueller is a perfect example young kid german came to us he had two years of engineering uh background when we hired him big strong strapping kid so we hired him maybe a little because of that but because he was just a big strong guy this is the first volvo and our um our water maker goes out halfway between the start and Cape Town, and we're probably gonna have to pull into Rio. Nobody knew about this. Mickey Mueller and Casey Smith took a bilge pump and a bunch of spare parts from different things and made the world's best water maker desalinator from just crap in the boat. That's the type of person that every Volvo teams need because that Mickey Mueller moment, that that desalination. We can't live unless we make water. We can't, we can't eat, we can't drink, we can't do anything. We have to drop out as quickly as possible. That's what makes or breaks these boats. You have to get around, you gotta get around safely first and in one piece and you gotta get around. And the, those types of people are necessary at every single level. Oh, Ken, listen, it's always so interesting hearing about the stories that we miss and uh, hearing a, an honest take on the sort of journey to success. Listen, it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm sure you're uh, like the rest of us, you're pretty locked down, but I also appreciate that you are quite a busy person. So thank you very much for talking us through some of the highs and lows, as you put it, of a fantastic sailing career. Thank you. It's not over yet. Don't, don't, don't stick a pin in it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks now. Great to talk to you anytime. Well, thanks very much for joining us for our chat with Ken Reed, president of North Sales and, of course, three times Ocean Race competitor. We're going to have plenty more of these interviews coming up, so you won't want to miss them. Subscribe to our social media channels for all the latest updates.